Good morning, my friend. I hope you're doing well. It's 4.30 in the morning on Thursday. It's the 20th of January, 2022, and we are we have arrived at the last episode of Season 3. We are at Episode 100 of Season 3 of the Dr. Lee Warren Podcast. I can't believe it. Um, January is going gangbusters. The podcast has been downloaded in 77 countries around the world. We are way on track for our best month ever so thank you for listening for sharing it with your friends uh, for the constant prayer support of uh, me writing the new book and getting this positive message out around the world and i thought how more appropriate uh, than to wrap up the season by by going back and looking at something that we've been talking about the whole time hope my new book of course called hope is the first dose and it's all about sort of the the treatment plan for how we find hope and faith again when life knocks the the wind out of us and when not, well, life knocks us down and and so Lisa had a good idea the other day and she said you know you really ought to spend a few episodes talking about the the science of what happens to your brain uh, in a hopeful or hopeless state how your brain responds to faith and hope and happiness and loss and doubt and fear and all that we've done some of that in the past but we're going to do a recurring series of episodes coming up in season four not every one in a row um, because we we have Tuesdays with Tata, and we've got some interviews coming up, and we got, uh, of course, quiet time and self brain surgery and all those things that we do around here. But we're going to do a series, kind of like we did back when I did the 15 Infinitely Happier episodes, and we're going to look at your brain on hope. And so I thought, let's finish season three with going back and looking at my, my probably favorite episode that we've done about hope was one that I called The Spectrum of Hope. And it's all about how you move along that line, because it's not like you're either hopeful or you're hopeless. It's not like that. Life is a, is a spectrum. It's a constant moving back and forth between things, depending on how uh, the events of our lives play out, right? I mean, most of us, no matter how much we understand that happiness deter- is determined mostly by um our decisions rather than our circumstances if we really want to be truly happy no matter how much we understand that we still are prone to reacting to life's difficult circumstances by having uh, moved towards hopelessness when things are hard right we have a friend right now who's in hospice and he's a young man and it's hard for him not to feel hopeless because he's literally dying right so how do you find an ability to feel hope and hold on to faith even when the facts on the ground as my friend Gordon Livingston said when the map says things are bad how do you still find light and hope and faith and use that to move forward in a way that tells a good story with your life well the spectrum of hope episode will help with that we're going to wrap up season three um, and I'm going to play a song one of my favorite songs about hope is from Crowder David Crowder with Torin Wells just him and a piano and those two men with amazing voices, and it's called All My Hope. And so we'll play this episode. We'll play All My Hope at the end. We're going to start season four. It's going to feel a little different, going to shake up the music a little bit. Uh, we got some uh, new stuff coming from Tommy Walker and, and all kinds of uh, stuff. We have a great interview coming this Friday that I'll probably play on Sunday um, for with Philip Yancey to talk about his new memoir. And, of course, if you've been around for any length of time, you know how important Philip Yancey is to me, but we'll tell that story again on the podcast. We have... Um, some great sort of scientific looks at what hope and faith and doubt and fear and the things we think we know are all about coming up in a few weeks. Um, and we just have some great stuff. I'll have some news about the new book hopefully in the next few weeks. Um, and we're just a lot of good things coming up for season four. And I just want to thank you for your support and for listening and for helping me every day to change my mind and change my life. And like I'm always telling you, you, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And you have to start today. So we're going to go back a little bit, hit the spectrum of hope, and then we're going to be coming at you with all kinds of amazing things. My friend, I want you to become healthier, feel better, and be happier. And to do that, you have to change your mind because that's when you can change your life. We love you. We're praying for you. We're grateful for you. We're looking forward to season four. And I hope you have an amazing day. Here's the spectrum of hope, followed by David Crowder and Torin Wells with all my hope. And all you have to do is start today. Hey, friend, I'm so glad to have you listening today. It's season three of the Dr. Lee Warren podcast, and I am sitting here on the banks of the North Platte River in Nebraska of the United States with my incredible wife, Lisa, my father-in-law, Tata, and the super pups, Harvey and Lewis. 
I'm a neurosurgeon and an author, and I'm here to help you harness neuroscience, the power of your brain, faith, the power of your spirit, and good old common sense to help you lead a healthier, better, happier life. Listen, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind, and I'm here to help you learn the art of self-brain surgery. To get it done, you can get the show notes and more on my website at wleewarnmd.com. And if you like the show, please, please subscribe so you never miss an episode and share it with your friends. We are in 77 countries around this beautiful planet Earth last month, and it can go even farther if you share it with your friends. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. We're here to help you change your mind so you can change your life. Let's get after it. Hey, friend. Welcome back to the show. I am so excited about today's show because we're going to jump right into episode 24 of the Dr. Lee Warren podcast, The Spectrum of Hope. Now, I'm doing something a little different today in that I am broadcasting from my mobile setup. So it's a little different setup than I have down in my studio. And so um, I'd love any feedback that you have about the sound quality. It's a totally new sort of setup for me. And if you're the type of person who likes to geek out about the technical stuff, if you're interested in what I do and how I do it on the podcast, shoot me an email, lee at drleewarren.com. I'd be happy to share that information with you if you're a podcaster or curious about how this all works. Um, Today we're going to look at how we can move along the lines between faith and doubt, the lines between confidence and fear. We're going to learn how to land on hope no matter what happens. We're looking at the spectrum of hope, and we're starting today. Hey, I'm really glad to have you listening today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. It is 4.35 in the morning on a Friday, and I'm coming at you live from Casper, Wyoming in the United States of America with my incredible wife, Lisa Warren, who lives here in the freest place in the country with me. I am a neurosurgeon and a writer, and I'm here to help you harness neuroscience, the power of your brain, faith, the power of your spirit, and good old common sense to help you lead a healthier, better happier life. Listen, you can't change your life until you change your mind, and we're here to help you learn the art of self-brain surgery to get that done. You can get the show notes and more on my website at wleewarrenmd.com. If you like the show, please subscribe so you never miss an episode, and please rate and review it wherever you listen to podcasts. That's how other people find out about the show so they can learn how to change their minds too this show is being listened to in all 50 states the district of columbia and last week over 60 countries in the world people learn about it when you share it with them so thanks in advance for the ratings reviews and shares and shout out to new listeners from all over the world we are almost in every country in western europe except for finland so if you know any Finns. Let them know they're missing out. We'd love to have them on board. This is a Dr. Lee Warren podcast where we're changing our minds so we can change our lives. Let's get after it. Hey, I want to share something funny with you. At least it's funny to me. Um, the past two weeks in my practice have been pretty rough. There's been another little little batch of malignant brain cancers, and I've had to have that conversation with several families. And there's been a bunch of other difficult things that people have been having to go through. And on top of that, our organization is going through a big political uh, organizational change, and there's a lot of difficult conversations and decisions that are being made. And, and it's just been a tough few weeks. So all of that stuff being said is harder than brain surgery, having those conversations, dealing with institutional change, dealing with people going through hard things. It's all harder than what I actually do in the operating room. Now, if you've read my book, you know that I really struggle with how to talk to a family, to a patient, when I think I already know the outcome of their problem. I I, I struggle in that zone between what I know from science, I know the outcome here is going to be a certain way, and what I believe from my spirit, that you're supposed to to pray and fight and, and, and keep going no matter what. And so how do you encourage someone to keep up hope and have faith and pray for healing, all of which I firmly believe in, when your brain tells you that the outcome is already determined? That's the thing that I struggle with. And when the scan shows a certain type of tumor, like a glioblastoma, for for example, I say to myself, I've seen the end of you because of all the stuff that I know about that tumor and how it always behaves. And yet the Bible tells us to pray when someone is sick, James five fourteen through 16. It says that nothing is too hard for God, not even stage four brain cancer. So I struggle in the place between what I believe and what I think I know. In fact, I thought about that problem so much that that's what my book's about. I wrote a whole book about that problem, and we've talked a lot about that on this podcast. I hope you read it because I think it'll help you. And the funny thing I was going to share with you is I was on the phone with my parents 
about a week ago, and my dad told me a story about one of his clients. Now, this this man lives in the same small town that my parents live in, in the town that I grew up in, Broken Bow, Oklahoma. It's a great place. People are friendly. They work hard. They're just good, good blue-collar people for the most part. And my dad tells me that this man walks into his office and he said, Hey, I really liked Lee's new book, but you need to tell him that he thinks too much. He needs to stop worrying about everything and just accept it. Dad, I thought that was funny. And the reason I think it's funny is because if I didn't think and worry so much about stuff like that, like the I've seen the interview problem, I never would have written the book. I work things out in my mind by chewing on them. And when I chew on them, I tend to write about them. And that turns into newsletters and podcasts and blogs and ultimately into books. Now I'll confess that I do excessively worry sometimes, although um, – I do that. Um, remember I wrote in, I don't know if you read my first book, No Place to Hide. It's about my experience in the Iraq War and afterwards. And I, and I shared a story in there of a hospital chaplain. I called him Chaplain W to protect his identity. But Chaplain W told me, pray more, worry less, and let God do the rest. And I need to learn that lesson. But ironically, after my dad's friend told him that I need to stop thinking so much, I realized that if I did that, I wouldn't have books to write, and therefore I wouldn't be able to help you <laughs> with some of the things that I actually worry too much about. So I guess everything has a, a double side to it, a blessing and a curse, right? So there you go. I work through my problems by writing, and maybe I do need to pray more, worry less, and let God do the rest. Maybe you do too. So we're talking about faith and doubt and the things we think we know. And if you think about a spectrum, a line, from one side to the other, if you started on the left with knowledge, with things that you absolutely know, and then a little more towards the right of that line, you would have faith, things that you believe, but you don't necessarily, you aren't necessarily able to see them or tangibly prove them. And we would have to put that in the category of faith, right? And then if you slide a little further to the right of that, there are things you're just not quite sure about. And we would call those doubts. So we have knowledge on the left and faith a little to the right of that and doubt a little to the right of that. But that's too simple of a spectrum that doesn't encompass all aspects of what we uh, know and believe and doubt. Because faith is not the opposite of knowledge and doubt is not the opposite of faith. There are waypoints, there are there. Are stops on the way along that spectrum such as beliefs and questions and we pass through and we navigate life and we go back and forth between these zones between faith and doubt and knowledge and certainly you can believe something that you don't know much about for example you believe in nuclear bombs but you don't really know much about how they work unless you're david martirano or somebody a lot smarter than i am but you believe that they do work because you've seen their devastation. You've seen the pictures of the, the cities and the and the towns that were blown up by them in the world in the Second World War. And you can have real questions about something that you have great faith in without actually doubting it, right? I want to know, for example, why God let my son Mitch die. But wanting to question God doesn't make me doubt that God is there. So we want to spend most of our time on that left side of the line over there in knowledge because we're comfortable when we know things. As humans, are in our weakness, we want to know stuff, and we feel more comfortable in the places where we're certain or we think we're certain. Now, before we go any further into this topic in this short little episode that I'm putting together with just this one thought in mind, but before we go any farther, I want to just take a minute to share something that I think will help you. It's almost like a public service announcement for my newsletter. If you're not getting my newsletter, by the way, please take a second to go to my website, wleewarrenmd.com slash newsletter, and sign up. It's free, and it connects us, and you can reply to my newsletter, and we can have a conversation. We can pray about stuff with each other, and, and people all over the world every Sunday are reading this and connecting, and Lisa and I love to hear from you, and, and that's the portal. That's the way that we can talk to each other. It's my weekly prescription for how you can change your mind and change your life. And a few weeks ago in my letter, I wrote about a book that I recently read. And I want to talk about it a little bit more today because I think it'll help and it's certainly relevant to this topic about the spectrum of hope. And once in a while, I read a book that sort of fundamentally changes how I look at something. In the past two years, I've been on a streak of that. I found these transformative books that really just kind of bend my brain around some topic that I thought I understood pretty well, but that I end up uh, needing a little bit more 
light on and when I read a book about us, these, these kinds of ideas, sometimes it just breaks me and changes what I thought. And at 51 years old, frankly, it's hard to change your perception and your perspective on a lot of things because you, you pretty much think you've got your worldview figured out by the time you're in your 50s, right? Well, books have give us an opportunity to shift our perspective. They give us an opportunity to see something from someone else's perspective. And sometimes that results in us changing our viewpoint or even our worldview on some things. Here's a few examples. There's a novel called The Beekeeper of Aleppo. I've talked about it before on this podcast, and hopefully we're going to talk about it again because I'm trying to get Christy Lefteri to come onto the show as a guest. And I think that's going to work out in a month or two, so I'll let you know. Um, but The Beekeeper of Aleppo is a book that Christy Lefteri wrote, and it's a beautifully written look at the refugee problem. And honestly, I've, I've never really thought about refugees as individual people, and that's a sin. I'm sorry about that. Um, I've, all, I've always thought about it as a system problem. Like these countries are having some kind of problem that's producing strife, and it's displacing all these people, and, and they're moving to some other place, which is going to create a problem in that place for that government and those taxpayers. And, and you know, I've, often, I've, I've always thought about it in this kind of big 30,000-foot view. And Christie's book changed that because she makes you look at it from the perspective of one family, a man and his wife and his son and what's happening when their government is blowing up and there's civil war and strife and, and he's a beekeeper and he loses his bees and, and he loses his son and, he, and they've got to get out of there, not because they're trying to go and mess up the demographic of some other place, but they've got to get out of there because they're going to die if they stay there. Their way of life has been destroyed and the other people's decisions have blown up their world. And so it, it takes this, I love the book, not really because I'm so interested in the refugee problem, although now I am, but more because of how she skillfully changed my view of a big problem by making me look at it in a little way, at, at, on, a, on a micro level, at one individual person. And, and it just, it, it's a beautiful book because of that. And in fact, because of that, my wife and I are now supporting an organization and a young man whose work are all about ministering to refugees. So there's a, there's an example of how a book can change how you perceive something to the point that you might actually get involved in it. And so The Beekeeper of Aleppo is one of those books that I recently read. I cannot recommend it highly enough to you. I think it's outstanding. Another book was a book by Brian Stevenson called Just Mercy. I read it a year and a half ago. Now it's a movie that's out. I haven't seen the movie yet. This book fundamentally changed how I look at the problem of capital punishment. Honestly, again, I grew up in a fundamentalist Christian tradition, and uh, the prevailing notion was sort of eye for an eye. You know, if you do something wrong, society's got to punish you for it. And that's sort of still true in my brain, and the Bible does teach that, but it, it the underlying premise of why that would work is if the system was actually correct when it convicts somebody and sentences them to death. But what you'll learn if you if you take the time to read Brian Stevenson's book, and I implore you to do so, is that it is not, in fact, an equally just thing in, in terms of who gets the death penalty and how those sentences are constructed and how they're carried out and, and lots of other things about the justice system in that book. It's not just about capital punishment, but but there are some alarming and absolutely true statistics that Brian Stevenson brings out in that book. Like, for example, this, which is unbelievable. Did you know that you are 17 times more likely, 17 times more likely to be executed of committing a murder if the victim is white than if the victim was black in the United States? 17 times. So that that statistic alone should tell you that there's a problem with our capital punishment system. It's not equal. So this book just points out a lot of the a lot of the facts. It's not it's not about race. It's not about um politics. It's about the system and how it's set up and the fact that there are some real problems with how capital crimes are charged, how they're uh, juries are selected, how the the punishments are not equally distributed among 
race and gender and whether or not people have mental illnesses. And it's just one of those books that, that, that really just made me look at a problem, a system problem, in a different way than I had always looked at it. So whether you like it or not, whether you agree with the conclusions that Brian Stevenson makes or not, I would say this is one of those things like are we as a society executing people who don't deserve to be executed? Or maybe another way to look at the question would be, are we executing people of one particular type more often and for the same crimes than we are executing people of a different type? And if the answer to any of those questions is yes, then we have to change the system as a society. So it's one of those books that you ought to read just for the purpose of learning to look at a problem from a different perspective. Now, one of, I think one of the problems we're having in our society today – to be really honest with you, and again, my my podcast is not about politics. So I'm, like I said, politically conservative, religious, all those things are true. But one of the problems that we're having in our society today is that we're not talking to each other. And we're not debating in the public square anymore. We're not thinking about problems and letting you have your opinion and me have in mind. And we talk to each other and we still love each other at the end of the day. No, what we're seeing is this greater increasing divide where – I think about something my way and you think about it your way. And if you don't agree with me, then you are a XYZist, you're a racist, you're a xenophobe, you're this or that, you're, you're some kind of label. Instead of we're just two individuals who can love each other and disagree with something but, li but listen and converse with each other, right? And I think reading gives us an opportunity to, in a calm way, hear somebody else's perspective. And so I would suggest to you that if you're not reading outside of your comfort zone, you're missing a great opportunity to learn and grow. So those two books, The Beekeeper of Aleppo and Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson, both gave me opportunities to look at something from a different perspective, and I came away learning a lot and changing how I think in some ways about a lot of those things. The third book is Good or God by John Bevere. I've talked about that a little bit recently too, and I'm going to do a longer episode about the notions that he brings up. But that book made me fundamentally in my spirit want to move beyond the desire to just have good things in my life. I want God things in my life. I want to know that what I'm striving after, what I'm working for, what I'm seeking is what God wants for my life because that's always going to be better than just something that I think is good. And the last one is a book called Love Like You've Never Been Hurt by Jensen Franklin. I think, honestly, it's, it's perhaps the most powerful book on how to forgive and how to love other people that's ever been written outside of the Bible. Love Like You've Never Been Hurt by Jensen Franklin. This book will change your heart on relationships. And I just, I would encourage you, if you're a person who's been hurt deeply by somebody else, if you've been um, wounded by another human relationship, you need to read that book. It'll give you a perspective that will help heal your heart, help make your family better. It will help mend relationships. It will help you love like you've never been hurt by Jensen Franklin. Now those four books, The Beekeeper of Aleppo, Just Mercy, Good or God, and Love Like You've Never Been Hurt, that's a list of books that you can come back to whenever you're ready to have your heart broken, your eyes open, your spirit lifted, and your soul healed. But the book that I wanted, that I shared in my newsletter that I was so excited about is another book that shifted my perspective fundamentally on a different topic. This topic was prayer. I've read a lot of amazing books about prayer. Frankly, because sometimes I wonder if it makes any difference and I struggle with it. But some of those m amazing books were written by people like Philip Yancey, Richard Foster, and Timothy Keller. They've all written books on prayer that are just powerful and should be read. But Craig Groeschel, the pastor of Life Church in Oklahoma City, really broke my brain with his new book, Dangerous Prayers. So the book, Dangerous Prayers, the subtitle is Because Following Jesus Was Never Meant to Be Safe. And this book messed me up. It, it, it gave me the idea that too often we pray for good things. God help me, protect me, expand me, bless, bless this food, forgive me, God guard and direct me. There's nothing wrong with those prayers. They are biblical and they're solid and they're sound and there's nothing wrong with them. But my question to you that Craig Rochelle made me think about for the first time, have any of those prayers that you often pray, God help me, Take care of me today. Give me thanks for this cheeseburger. Have any of those prayers, <laughs> I said cheeseburger, I must be hungry. Um, have any of those prayers ever changed your life? Have they ever changed the world? Those prayers that we pray are safe. 
they're easy. God, get me through this day. Help me do good on this test. Those prayers are safe, and there's nothing wrong with them. But Craig Rochelle in the book Dangerous Prayers, he wrote about prayers that can fundamentally change us to shape our future, break bondage, set us free, aim us higher, and even move God's heart. There are prayers like this one written by a man named Francis Drake in 1577. Listen to this prayer and tell me if you think this is a safe prayer to pray. It's not. Francis Drake wrote, Disturb us, Lord, when we are too pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we dreamed too little, when we arrived safely because we sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity, and in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wilder seas where storms will show your mastery. Where losing sight of land, we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hopes and to push back the future in strength, courage, hope, and love. This we ask in the name of our captain, who is Jesus Christ. Amen. That is a dangerous prayer. Asking God to disturb you, to make you want more, to stretch you out past your comfort zone. Add it to search me, O God, break me, God, send me, God, others like that. Those are dangerous prayers. And that book, Dangerous Prayers by Craig Rochelle, if you let it, it will change your prayer life. It will mess you up. It will change your whole life. And I suggest that you read it. And I would even suggest that you listen to it. He narrates the audiobook himself, and it is outstanding. Start praying dangerous prayers, prayers that can shake things up. Now, why am I talking about this in an episode about the spectrum of faith? We'll get back to that in a minute. I told you a while ago, get get back to this idea that we're always on a spectrum between knowledge on the left and fear on the right. And I believe that we want to spend most of our time on that left side of the line. We're comfortable in that knowledge zone. But when the biopsy comes back malignant or the phone call brings bad news, We sometimes move further to the right on that line. We move away from knowledge, past faith, into doubt, and sometimes even farther. The right-hand side of the spectrum gets to be a fairly scary place. I know because I've been there recently with lots of people as I've given them bad news. I've been there when I lost a son. I've been in that scary place. You keep moving to the right past doubt, and you finally get to the opposite of faith, which is fear. Look at that line in your mind, knowledge, to the right of that faith, to the right of that doubt, to the right of that fear. You're moving to the right. It gets progressively scarier. Philip Yancey wrote in his wonderful book, Reaching for the Invisible God, that fear is the opposite of faith, and he's right. When you're afraid, your faith shrivels. The ground starts to feel mushy under your feet. You don't trust anything. You don't trust anybody. You're wandering in a dark room, and you can't find your way. Nicholas Wolterstorff wrote a book called Lament for a Son after his son died. And he wrote that faith is like a footbridge that you don't know will hold you up until you step out onto it. But sometimes life brings us up to a cliff, and we've got to jump out onto the bridge of faith, or we will fall into the chasm of fear. A few years ago, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, a doctor, committed suicide. He had lost his wife, and he just couldn't see how he could ever be okay again. He lost his faith. He slid down the line past doubt and into fear, and despite a lot of us encouraging him and praying and pleading and trying to convince him that it would turn around, eventually he landed on the far right side of the line. There's a place past fear on that right side of the line. So if you start on the left, knowledge, and you move to the right, faith, doubt, fear, the last place you can land is hopelessness. And I told you before, and I wrote in my book, the worst thing you can encounter in your spirit in life, worse than cancer, worse than bankruptcy, worse than divorce, worse than losing a child, the worst thing you can encounter, the deadliest disease known to man, is hopelessness. And the message for you today, my friend, wherever you are in the world, Every day, in every situation, you must look for ways to move toward the left, to move across the spectrum from hopelessness towards faith. The footbridge will hold. If you just step out there, I promise the bridge will hold. Every little step, even a doubtful response like the guy in Mark 9. You remember Mark chapter 9? Guy comes to Jesus and he says, my, my child's dying. Help me if you can. And Jesus says, 
I can. You just have to believe. And the guy says, I do believe, but help me in my unbelief. And that's where we are. You, you can you can doubt, but just try to believe, and God will give you the next step. He gives you the confidence that the next step will be safe. And when you're in a dark room, even a little crack in the door can let some light in, and that light can be enough to guide you if you follow it and walk towards the light. That's what we see when we just make that shift and start looking back to the left towards faith. Turn yourself away from hopelessness and towards faith, and you'll find the next step. And it's still not that simple, because you might think in this metaphor that it's better to move past faith and towards knowledge, but it's really not, for the simple reason that most of the things we think we know can turn out to be things that we really just believe. And that's why I wrote I've Seen the Interview, because there are things we believe and things we know, and sometimes life makes us doubt the things we believe, but it really should make us doubt what we think we know. And that's why some people survive cancers their doctors think are terminal. It's why some people can lose their kids or go bankrupt or get divorced and still hold on to their faith because faith is better than knowledge. Faith is everything. My friend turned his face toward the problem of losing his wife. He turned his his heart towards the pain. And the problem is always to the right side of the line. But the light, my friend, is to the left. On last week's podcast, we talked about foxholes and faith and how to learn that little perspective shift from being so furious and broken about the mortars and instead learning to be thankful for the foxholes. And that little bit of self-brain surgery makes all the difference. If you want to become healthier and feel better and be happier in life, you can't be afraid all the time. You can't turn your face toward the problem because the bridge to feeling better is on the other side of the problem and it starts with a step. You take a step away from believing that whatever is hurting you or holding you back is bigger than you can overcome. And what would that step look like for you? Look, you don't have to make the whole journey in one leap. You just have to take that first step to the right or to the left. I'm sorry. What if realizing that life is going to keep lobbing mortars at us instead of shaking our fists at God? What if we shifted our perspective? What if we started thanking him for the foxhole that he always provides to shelter us from the storm. What if we really believe that James 1, 2 through 4 is true when James says in the voice translation, don't run from tests and hardships, brothers and sisters. As difficult as they are, you will ultimately find joy in them. If you embrace them, your faith will blossom under pressure and teach you true patience as you endure. And true patience brought on by endurance will equip you to complete the long journey and cross the finish line, mature, complete, and wanting nothing. So think about the dangerous prayers idea. What if we started saying, okay, God, I know there are going to be hard times. I know there will be hard things. Help me lean into you during them. Help me grow right through them. Use me. Use those problems to change me, to fulfill your promises, to be there with me, to help other people see me handling hard times and be encouraged that they can too. What if we did that? That's a dangerous prayer because you're not asking God to take away all the mortars anymore. You're asking him to help you hold up during the attacks. What would that step look like for you? Wouldn't that feel like you were making a conscious choice to turn away from fear and take a step toward the more solid ground of faith? It would certainly be empowering. From a neuroscience standpoint, when you do things that are empowering, when you do things to step into your problem and face them more boldly, it helps your brain chemistry. It helps you get stronger. It helps you become more resilient. Look, I said before, you don't have to make the whole journey in one leap. You just have to take a step. And the step is that mental shift away from the problem and more towards the promise, away from the fear and more towards the faith. Remember, you can't shake your fist at God and roll up your sleeve to get busy at the same time. You can't tackle problems if you're looking at fear as being bigger than the promise that you're going to be okay. And you can't change your life until you change your mind. You have to move across the spectrum of hope, and you have to start today. Yeah.
a prodigal return. All my hope is in Jesus. Thank God my yesterday is gone. All my sins are forgiven. Hey friend, I hope you enjoyed the show. Go to the website wlewarnmd.com for more information about my newsletter, The Prayer Wall, wlewarnmd.com slash prayer and more. Check out the website wlewarnmd.com. The theme music for the show is Water Into Wine by my friend Tommy Walker, graciously provided by free for free by Tommy and the good people who are changing the world over at Tommy Walker Ministries. Check it out and consider supporting their great work at tommywalkerministries.org. TommyWalkerMinistries.org. Don't forget, friend, the power is in prayer. Pray first, and if you need prayer or want to pray with us for other people all around the world, go check out the prayer wall at wlwarnmdcom slash prayer. Be praying for us as we are presenting my book to publishers in the next few days, and hope is the first dose will be in the world soon for you, and I hope it will be helpful. So pray about the publication process. Remember, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind, and you have to start today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. I will talk to you soon. God bless you, and have a great day. Thank you.